Jim, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Been good catching up with you before we get uh, started. And uh, I want to start, uh, you caught quite a few headlines, at least in church leader circles last year, when you announced that you were shutting down all the locations to your church, sort of consolidating, amalgamating back into one location. You lead a very large church in Charlotte. And and what really intrigued me about that was it seems to be a counter uh, cultural or counter trend move. This seems to be the era where everybody, if you own a restaurant, you're opening more locations. If you own a business, you're opening multiple locations. If you have church, you're opening multiple locations and you pivoted and did the other thing. Can, so can you just sort of give us a bit of context on that and then tell us, tell us what happened? Sure. Well, the context is we were one of the pioneers in the multi-site movement. We had our first uh, site, second site back in 2003. So uh, that was early days. That was early experiment. Um, In May of last year, we closed all of them at the same time. How many was all of them, Jim? Uh, Four. Okay. So uh, in uh, so we closed them, and it was not out of crisis. It wasn't out of failure. It wasn't out of anything at all. It was a after several months of very strategic reflection. Uh, Most of the sites were actually growing rather nicely. Um, Uh But here here was the key for us. And we can talk more about the specific reasons why we did this. But the the question that I always keep as a leader, and I think every leader does, if I have a finite amount of resources, I have a finite amount of staff, team, money, time, uh, and I've got it all going toward this endeavor. And if I start sensing that even if that's bearing fruit, if I start sensing that I might could bear more fruit doing this, well, I'm going to start really being ruthless in evaluating what I'm currently doing. And I think that's what um, I hope marks uh, my leadership. And I think it, it, whether it marks me or not, I think it marks good leadership is that you're constantly evaluating methodologies and you're not wed to them. There are no sacred cows. So you're always looking at methodologies saying, is this the best way to achieve the mission and to reach the goal? So I began to sense probably two years ago that um, I had question marks about that this was the best use of our funds. Well, to finish the narrative, since we closed the sites, um, we baptized over 400 people last year. Uh, we, um, we, uh, had our largest set of Christmas services ever. Wow. We had our largest, um, uh, we had our largest growth quarter October through December of 19 compared to October through December of 18. We grew by around 20%. And when you're our size, that's a staggering number. Yeah. So you, and, and your and age, cause your church math. is how old? Yeah. Well, we started in 92. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if that was a two-year-old church, that would be way more predictable than a church that's been around for almost three decades. Or when you're our size, too, because a lot yeah. of harder it is to get those. But I don't say that in any, to point out anything other than, for us, closing the sites did not hurt us. In fact, it accelerated the speed of our growth, and we had just a fantastic you know, run uh, since we've done it. And we can talk about why we did it, but that's kind of the story. What well, um. Let's go back to two years ago when, because I know that feeling as a leader, not necessarily to shut down your locations, but every once in a while, you know, I'm sure you're really excited about it when you launch them, the whole deal. What was the fir- what were the first stirrings that made you go, huh, I wonder if this, it, it's time to change. What were yeah, some of the first stirrings? Um, this isn't always the way it works, but in this particular case, it was wanting to invest in some things that I thought held enormous promise and I didn't have the resources to do it because I had the bulk of these resources going toward this. And so that got me frustrated. So I just wanted to make sure that this really was the best use of these resources. So for in our case, here we had an enormous amount of money going toward our sites and I wanted to do more and more and more in light of the digital revolution and more and more in light of, 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 uh, the app and the website and, and, and social media and, and, um, that kind of, um, marketing. And, and I didn't have the resources to do the kinds of things I wanted to do. And then I began to look at our database and how the database and most databases these days are completely outdated and what it would take to actually write our own, to be able to do what everything I wanted it to do and to work seamlessly, particularly with mobile technology. And so on and on this began to go. And I just, I just began to just 
say, okay, I'm going to start from scratch. If, if I wanted to grow the church the most effectively, is this really where I would put my money? And you mentioned something earlier that is true, but I'm going to beg to differ a little bit on it. Yeah, go ahead. You're saying that we're in an age where churches are just increasingly going multi-site and restaurants are adding locations and all that. All right, well, let me give you another one to think about. Think about the banking industry. Yeah. Banking industry is closing branches like crazy because they're realizing that people are going to bank on their phone. And so their old model was bricks and mortar. Their old model was if we don't have a branch every five miles, maybe we're going to lose customers because everything's based on the branch model. Now they can't close them fast enough because they only need branches for very specific things. And almost everything is now online and it's done through your phone. See, for my thinking, that's something worth looking at as an enterprise, as much as the other side where it seems like people can't expand physically enough. So I think that we're in the midst of a digital revolution that is changing everything and it's changing how people explore church. It's a changing how churches reach out. It's changing everything. And for us, um, we wanted to divert our resources toward that. And so far, so good. Well, I want to come back to the whole digital part and I want to camp there. But before we get to it, I want to unpack the decision making because I think there's two things going on. There's there's the actual decision that you're making, which is, OK, we got four locations. We're going to shut through, you know, three down and, and go back to one uh, or move forward into one. But there's also the other leadership thing. And maybe we'll go there first, which is you're going to change something you started. I've always thought in leadership, it's pretty easy to go in. Like if I was your successor, okay, just to role play for a second, it's not that hard. You want to honor the past and say, thank you very much. But, you know, as a leader, you kind of want to make it your own. So yeah, this is the way Jim used to do it, but here's how we'll do it now, et cetera. And that's pretty normal in leadership. But when you have started something, it takes a certain degree of humility and courage, I think, to say, yeah, we're not going to do it that way anymore. Can you walk us through that process? Or maybe that wasn't a big deal for you. It's interesting. I, I don't want to sound cold. Yeah. But I'm very cold hearted toward methodology. Okay. I'm, I'm what would, what would um, break my heart is if a successor came in and wanted to change the DNA of our values or our mission or our customer. Uh, but I'm actually the nastiest person toward methodologies around um, and have uh, just has never bothered me to kill something successful. If I don't feel like it's actually successful for the mission, reaching who mm. it is we're wanting to reach. So size never has appealed to me. I did have a dark moment uh, or two when it became clear that we, it, it was the wisest thing for us to close the sites and move toward a different direction. I had a moment where I thought, Oh, but what are the optics going to be? Yeah. And, and, and not necessarily for Meckers because they get it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, okay. So this church down that street or that church over in that state, or these people are going to say, Oh, Meck must not be doing good. He's closing all the sites. Did you hear what happened? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and when I, when I actually realized that that dark thought came into my mind, it might actually alter the decision. Um, it was literally a moment where I said, Satan flee mm. on, mm. because if I start caring about that, then not only am I going to be a terrible leader, but I'm not going to be following the promptings of the Holy spirit. And you almost have to have a moment where not to be crude, but you have to say, you know, screw optics. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to heck with it. Cause I don't, I don't care. I'm doing this for an audience of one. I'm doing this to build this church and I'm not on a crusade to say that everybody ought to do this. I think multi-site's working in a lot of places. And if it's working for you, do it. Mm. Uh, and, and it was working for us. I just sent something could work better. And I only have X amount of time and resources. So, um, so yeah, the decision-making process was, was a journey. And I would say that it did. Gosh, I, and I don't want this to sound self-serving. It did take personal courage for me, but for sure. all the wrong reasons based on my own sin. Well, no, I get that. And that's why I asked the question, because I, th I think there is an implicit assumption in leadership that bigger is better. It's not always true that more is better than fewer. And I think it does take, uh, you know, at least a suspension of pride or swallowing your pride 
to be willing to be misunderstood to say, yeah, we went from four to one. I mean, that's not, that's not always the progression in leadership. So thank you for going there because I do think, I do think sometimes we back ourselves into corners as, as leaders simply because we don't want to admit that what doesn't appear to be progress might actually be progress. Like I used to have two podcasts and then I'm like, ah, and the other one was doing okay, but I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to do one. And then I gave the other one away, right? It'll probably get resurrected this year by a new leader. And it's like, yeah, that's okay. I used to do two. The one didn't work out the way I hoped. I'm just going to shut it down. But that, that took a moment. And I had a moment like you where I'm like, well, what would people say? And then I thought, well, that's not actually the metric, right? So, uh, okay. So back to, to now you had unique circumstances in Charlotte because you and I've had this conversation before um, when we were just coaching a group of leaders. Uh, but there was some talk, talk about one of the specific factors sure, that sure. made this possible. I, I can very quickly tell you um, the, 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 the six big reasons why we, we did this. And I can do this very quickly. One, um, uh, I felt it was a dated approach. Hmm. Dated in light of the new digital realities. Um, one of the things that I've blogged about and I've written about is that uh, the multi-site began to explode or began on the scene in the 1990s, late 90s. The first book came out in like 03 or 04 and Things of that nature. Our first site was 2003. The iPhone wasn't released till 2007. Yeah. I mean, the whole revolution happened after this began to be explored as a strategy. Um, so in one sense, it sounds weird to say multi-site is dated. But from a technological standpoint, in terms of how that's changed the game, yes, it's dated. Second, it's a physical approach in a digital world. Yeah. The whole reason for the multi-site was that you were trying to remove physical barriers uh, for us, at least, it was all about making it easier for someone who attends Mac to invite a friend and to check things out. Now, the only way a friend could, who was invited could check things out was a physical visit uh, back when we started. I mean, that, that it was a physical thing. So the multi-site was a physical uh, reaction to a physical barrier. Well, it's a physical approach now in a digital world. That is not how someone uh, uh, explores the church. Uh, and it's not even how our people intuitively invite people. They're going to go online. They're going to check out an online campus service. They're going to explore you that way. All of that is before they ever physically darken your doorstep. And then that means that they're already something of a fan, somewhat already intrigued, already have something that they like because they've checked you out online. So that makes the third thing, the 20-minute rule, more obsolete. It used to be said that if somebody's 20 minutes or more away from your physical campus, they're just not going to do it. So you need to have physical campuses every 20 minutes. Well, the only reason a campus, for example, works for someone like us uh, is because 20 minutes away, we've got a body of people who like Mech who can invite their friends to that campus. So we already know that once someone's a fan, they'll drive 20 minutes or more. That's right. how come you could start a site there. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody now becomes a fan online and they like the talks, they like the services, that's how they checked you out, driving 25, 27 minutes is not a big deal anymore. So we're not having to fix that barrier. The fourth thing, which is what you alluded to, is that for a lot of churches, it is a situational need. Uh, uh, they, they don't have the capacity to absorb the crowd. They, um, uh, there's not good roads. They're in the process of a relocation. There's a whole bunch of reasons why this could be the case. For us, it was the Outer Belt. Charlotte's uh, Outer Belt project was why we bought the 80 acres that we're on. We've got 80 acres. And we bought it because the Outer Belt has a destination exit uh, one mile from here. And it was dreamlike. And we got the property. And the only reason that property was available because it was an assemblage of two pieces of property. And there was like a 50-acre piece and like a 30-acre piece. And it was a 30-acre piece that made it so valuable and worthwhile. And it was owned by a farmer who said, I will sell to anybody but a developer. <laughs> so I went... Knocked on his door one day, and about an hour later, after some lemonade and iced tea, I got the assemblage. And after that got public, we had developers offering us three times what we paid for it within wow. 90 days. So we got the largest piece of land left in Charlotte at the time. Uh, and this was in the 90s. Right? Yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. find 80 acres in a city like Charlotte. Right. So it's just not there. So, um, but dang, if the Outer Belt took forever to be built. <laughs> We're talking years and years and years. Yeah. Didn't get completed until like 2015. And then the infrastructure that served our campus didn't get completed till last year. 
Wow. And so suddenly what was a 45 minute drive to get here was now like 13 minutes, 12 minutes. I mean, it's changed everything. So when it was completed, the city shrunk for us. <laughs> yeah. For us. And then um, another thing that happened for us was that we did a, a, a massive survey uh, of our people, of several thousand of our attenders, and we just asked them a series of questions. And we found that they were intuitively inviting their friends to online or digital things before physical, that if they did invite them to a physical, they were bringing them here to this originating campus. Um, they didn't feel a site near them was needed to reach their unchurched friends. We just found that we were giving them a tool they didn't ask for, they didn't need, they didn't want. And the Meckers that were attending our sites were doing it out of faithfulness to the mission because we asked them to. Really? Uh, when? Yeah. Okay, can I ask, and you may not know the answer to this question because it's probably data-driven, but when when did that, because you said something really significant there. You said that people are tending to invite their friends online before they invite them in person. Do yeah, you know when that happened. shift would have happened? Oh, I think that started for us about three or four years ago. Yeah. But I think now it's just, um, it's just the norm. I mean, it's just the way everybody talks. It's just like, here's the link, check it out, right? Absolutely. Like when you go to a restaurant, you haven't even either been to Yelp or their site, right? To check it out. You do when that. You check, yeah, when you check the social media feeds, I mean, uh, Meckers are very active inviters, but it's always, hey, check it out online, check it out online, check it out online. Mm -hmm. And then once you check it out, did you like it? Oh, great. Well, come with me. And they were inviting yeah. to the broadcast location, which is your, just so that people who may not might be familiar, that's the big, like, you know, 100,000 square foot, whatever, as opposed to your sites would have been a little smaller and a little more that's another thing. That's another yeah. thing Kerry, that I think is, um, is hurting, I think, some multi-site approaches, yeah. which is yeah. there's a little bit of bait and switch. Okay. Uh, they, they see this wonderful thing online. They're captivated by it. They go to a campus near them. And then it's that guy on the screen mm -hmm. or it's a band that is not as quite as good as what I saw online. Um, and it's meeting in a YMCA and you know, it's just like, it's just, it's just not quite the same online experience. One of the things that we found that has accelerated things is that if the online experience there's not a drop off. There's actually a step up when you when you physically experience it. That if anything, it's better. Uh, okay, so if you go to your broadcast location, people perceive it as better. But is you that what you're saying? To. Yeah, you, want you, you want them to. You yeah. want to have them. You want to have them experience Got something okay. they're not experiencing online. You don't want them to feel like it dropped. Right. Right. Yeah, and so that's are, arguably what was happening at some of your sites is... I would imagine it would. I would imagine mm -hmm. that's what's happening at sites all over the world. Yeah. It's very difficult for every site to have equal quality. And if you're doing what most people do, which is to have uh, live and then all the sites be video venues, then you automatically have a different experience because it's a video venue. Um, and so... And so the last reason, the sixth reason was after those was that we, we just, we were taken with the potential of investing in all things digital mm -hmm. and just felt like it was just going to be a, a better investment. And so, no. And For I all those that, reasons. Now, were you expecting growth when you did the big switch last year? No, I expected a hit. I expected, uh, well, let me just put it this way. I didn't know fully what to expect. Mm -hmm. But I anticipated losing a certain percentage from all the sites. I, I anticipated um, uh, a drop in income. I yeah. anticipated, um, well, at least these are the things that we worked to try to offset. Uh, right. People who put blood, sweat, and tears into those sites feeling betrayed. Um, and so, but it ended up where, uh, by God's grace, and a lot of careful work on the front end, talking to people individually and honoring people and just the way we did this, the work that we did months before it was even made public. So that it's like when we finally made the decision, everybody already knew except maybe the crowd. <laughs> you know? um, we but all your bought in people, all your volunteers, your key donors. Like, yeah. All of our, yeah, we were able to keep all of our full-time staff. We were able to keep and found new places for them. We, 
we able now another thing too that made this easier for us and some is that all of our sites were in rented facilities so we didn't okay. have to extricate ourselves from real estate that we had bought and bricks and mortar that we had built um and so we were able to which is something that i'm in hindsight i'm so glad i did i've always hesitated to buy land and build a building even though all the consultants say that's the way to make a site really hum I always hesitated because I just had this sense, but that's going to make it a lot harder to stop this if we want to stop it or move it to another place if we want to move it. I, there was a permanence to that with this whole thing that I was very hesitant about. And now I can say I'm so glad I was hesitant. And you because, rented for 17 years, 18 years, right? Well, all the, depending on the, on the age. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. But up to like three yeah. years old. Yes. We were in schools. We were in YMCA's. We were in, you know, places right. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk about the change management. Okay. One, one question before I get there. Um, did you have a number in your head uh, of, okay, we're probably going to take a 5% hit, 20% hit. Did you have a number in your head of what you thought the cost of this would be? I didn't. I just knew that I was going to work really hard to keep it as low as possible. But if you had told me that we were going to close the sites, and if anything, it would just like take off, right? Like higher and hotter than it ever had been. I would have made the decision a long time ago. I mean, I was, I was, I was you know, I, I, it was a risk. It was an experiment. But, and I've had a lot of people ask me, so, so why did that happen? I mean, is it just why? Because it yeah. doesn't make sense to close it all down. And I don't have all the answers. There's a lot that we're still processing. This is a lot of wet cement for us. But I will say this, um, in talking with other pastors of multi-site churches, um, going multi-site's hard. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very challenging thing as a leader. It's hard. I found it challenging because it's difficult to, to lead a site when you can't manage by walking around. Right. And you can't see things and you don't know what's going right or wrong. So it's hard to lead. It's hard to find a good site director because they're often people. You need someone with the personality of a leader, but who isn't able to teach. Perhaps I think um, you, you, your your focus is dissipated. I don't care how good your staff are. It, your senior staff are always thinking about multiple sites, and they're all different entities and different personalities, and and it's 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 difficult. Uh, I would say that one of the things that happened with us is when we ended them all, we were able to bring all of that energy and focus to bear on this one thing. And it just got electric. Wow. Wow. So how change management is really difficult. And you alluded to this earlier in what you were saying, like naturally, normally just human nature being what human nature is. And, you know, the church is, you got people who just get motivated selfishly and behave immaturely sometimes, just like any organization. But, you know, there are people who had blood, sweat, and tears invested. There are people who are like, well, now I got to drive 20 minutes to get to, to Mech, not five minutes. You were in my neighborhood. I'm not sure if my friends will come. How did you navigate? Like, what were the steps you rolled out to kind of minimize the impact of a, of a change that would be seen by many as loss? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that we did that any 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 leadership team would have done, but then I'll, but I'll tell you why it works so well for us. And I want and there's a big thing there that I want to talk about. Um, we communicated to all the interested stakeholders. We communicated one on one. We took out coffees. We explained. We we met with serving teams. We we did all the due diligence of that. Uh, the staff here had been brought along. Uh, you know, through multiple things. And I've been blogging on it. We've been talking about it as a staff. So everybody knew that this was kind of all just being thought about and, and explored. And so we, we kind of made that legal to do without saying, without at all hinting about what we felt the end was going to be, because we honestly didn't know. So it was like an open discussion. It was. So we let it be that. And we let it be where we were talking about this months before the decision was made. And so the decision for most lead well, for all of the leadership, it was almost anticlimactic. Hmm. By the time we got about at the six month mark of really evaluating it, everybody was feeling the same way. It's like, oh my right. gosh. I mean, when are we going to close the sites? I mean, come on, come on, let's go ahead and close them. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 we got to do this at the right time, the right way. And we have, we need to over communicate. 
So we went through all those kinds of steps, but here's, here's the, the key. We really did have a culture where everybody realized it's all about the mission, the methods are not what's protected, and our four-word mantra, it's not about me. Ah. And so that was so much a part of our culture that all I had to do, really, is stand up and say, guess what? This is one of those moments like we've had so many times before where we're going to shift for the sake of reaching lost people because we think we can reach more. Uh, it's not about us. Uh, this is a critical change. Uh, it's going to be for the mission. I mean, that's it. Wow. All I did was when I, I did a little two week series just to remind everybody about that stuff. And it was just played off the ABC thing. We just called it. This is us. And I did two weeks to say, okay, let me remind you, this is us. Here are mm. our values. Here's our mission. Here's things. So, uh, you know, this is just part of all that not a peep and just we could we kept almost probably 90 plus percent of all of our sites maybe more um in fact i the other day i met with uh, some of our site leaders and they can only point each one to maybe two or three families that they know of that were lost at every site at best wow just wow so yeah and that would show up by this point in your donor data in your your volunteer data you would see if there was some kind of exodus that was significant um did did anybody really like raise the placards and start protesting or did you get angry emails or you really didn't see that? Mm -mm. No, 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 not, not one. Everybody got it hmm. because it was, it was put in the context of, look, all we're trying to do is fulfill the mission. That's what we've been about all these years. Yeah. And we've made a lot of other changes. In fact, we even have as part of our membership class uh, and all of our, our gateway classes, we will say things like, look, um, we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're like the service. Let me go ahead and enter. Let me go ahead and make sure you understand. I can't even promise you that that's the kind of music style we're going to have in six months. I can't tell you whether even the weekend's going to be the front door anymore, but whatever the front door is, we're going to open it. So understand if you are attracted to a stylistically methodologically, um, you need to hold it like this because that is always changing. Isn't that interesting? Build it at the very beginning. That's something that that resonates with me. That's the kind of leader I am. It's like people ask me, wow, 10 million downloads, you're going to do podcasting forever. I'm like, I don't know. Right now, podcasting is working. It's reaching a lot of people, but there'll be a day where hopefully we'll get on it before it crests and declines, but there's going to be something else. And what I'm interested in, I'm not interested in podcasting. I'm interested in interviewing world-class leaders and dissecting leadership and bringing that to as many people as possible. So what's the best form for that? I don't know. We'll find the best form for it. Right now, seems to be podcasting. So it's a similar methodology. And I think it's hard, particularly over almost three decades now, not to get wedded to your methods because I see so many leaders get there. But it sounds like you really bake that in to your culture throughout. How have you how have you kept reinforcing that so that the point where you get to, I don't know whether you, you know, other than closing the church or I don't know, like that is a major decision is what I'm trying to say. Like there are a few more massive decisions you can make as a leader than no, we're going to close all locations and go to one. Like that's huge. Everybody gets impacted. And for it to go with so little opposition is, is pretty remarkable. So for leaders listening who maybe are realizing, oh no, uh, we're a little more wedded to the method than maybe I thought. How do you, how do you change that culture so that the method yeah. is secondary? I would go back and start casting the vision for the values and the vision and the methodologies. I mean, I mean the, the mission and I would start getting that ingrained and then say, okay, now let's look at our methodologies through this lens and see which ones are really effective. So if you have promoted, um, like, let me give you, here's a great example. Yeah, yeah. If, if you were back in the 90s and you built a church preaching the importance of uh, secret services yeah. and you started a church saying, we're going to have secret services, we're going to do Willow, we're going to do all this stuff, which is what the vast majority of churches started in the 90s did. That's, that, that was their thing. We're going to go we're going to go this approach. Um, and, and then if and so we're going to do this. Well, then when the sea shift went away from the classic secret targeted service, which was all presentational and not experiential, and it was 
you know, one short course at best and get out of it. When, when, uh, what was best to reach the lost began to be more experiential, began to be more, um, uh, less attractional, uh, or even lower seeker services moved to attractional then that moved to something different, um, uh, more experiential. If, if, if you, if you, if you were riding that cultural crest and you wanted to make that shift, you could have had a whole bunch of people cry foul because they associated doing a seeker service with the mission. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you, so if you as a leader said, no, 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 here's the mission, reach lost people through the local church right now, this is the method, but that may not be the way to do it three years from now. Well, if you led that way, then when it did come time to change the way you did weekends, and we had that moment where we canceled our midweeks, we changed our weekends, I sensed it all happening culturally, we began to be much more experiential and um, and participatory on the weekends, and a lot of other things began to change, and they're still changing, you know, drama moved to film and all of their kinds of things, and now our services now are radically different than they were even 12 months ago. In fact, our services are becoming very eclectic. So if you to come one weekend and say, oh, they're into acoustic, no, come next weekend, you'll see something different because that's part of the way people are too. My point is though, is that we never had anybody cry foul because the way we did it was we always made the methods servant to the mission. But if you start off saying, here's the method, and this is what killed and hurt the Southern Baptist Convention so bad is that they made Sunday school orthodoxy. They made Sunday school equivalent with being orthodox and evangelistic. So that if you didn't want to do Sunday school, then somehow you were anti-Jesus. Uh, or in some churches, it's if you don't want to do small groups. So right. you're, you're, you're heretical. Well, yeah, I've gotten some nowhere, of those emails. <laughs> yeah, nowhere in Scripture does it say thou shalt be in a small group. It's the one another's that we're to go after. Mm-hmm. Small groups are methodology. Sunday school is a methodology. Men's ministry is a methodology. It's all methodology. We only have one mission. <laughs> it is to evangelize the lost and to assimilate the evangelized and then disciple the assimilated and then unleash the discipled. Yeah. That's the flywheel. Yeah. That's it. And so everything else is secondary. So a lot of leaders that might be clear in their head, but what it feels like to me, Jim, is that you have spent a lot of time or enough time casting that vision to the entire church. And I was just listening to a podcast today with uh, Donald Miller, who I almost never miss an episode, Story Brand Podcast. He was interviewing uh, our mutual friend, Jeff Henderson. And, you know, Don made a really good point. He said, business leaders need to learn from church because leading a church is highly complicated. Like if you're running a business, right, with 10,000 people, 10,000 employees, somebody's really out of line, you fire them. Uh, you've you've got really 70 paid staff-ish, maybe 100 and everybody else is a volunteer. They can walk. And actually, you're asking them to give money. So you want to talk about a complex and serve and give and invite their friends. Like you want to talk about complicated leadership. That's complicated leadership. So what have been some of the keys that you've had to getting that many people to a place where they're like, oh, yeah, well, that wasn't the mission anyway. That was just a method. How do you do that? You've got to be able to explain it. You've got to be able to help them understand and constantly teach and constantly cast that vision and constantly uh, address when the thinking gets fuzzy. And it's it's a you have to spend a disproportionate amount of energy on it. I've 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 often said that um, that when you're dealing with a depraved church and every church is depraved, um, you you have to spend a disproportionate amount of energy on those things that involve death of self. So I don't have to spend any time or energy on trying to help people get their felt needs met. But I have to spend a big amount of energy to die to themselves, to uh, live for somebody else, to have this it's not about me mentality. But if you can cast that vision in an altruistic way where they they feel like this is the better form of themselves, like um, like if like if you almost cast it in a way like, OK, when you start feeling selfish and you want it about you, and you're clinging to this, hey, you're better than that. Mm. You're better than that. You care more about the kingdom than that. You're, you're one of these people with a towel over their arm. You're, one, you're not one of these narcissistic types. You're one that's willing to die on this hill for the sake of others because somebody died on that hill for you. So you're not, you're, you know, this is, this is what I believe about you, and this is the way we're going to be. 
And I think when you can when you can cast that vision in a way that inspires people uh, to where they want to give sacrificially and they want to 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 you know that's almost like the good thing to do, then um, then that's the key. So, ah, uh, man, I got a lot of questions I want to ask you. Uh, but just before we leave this question of consolidating into one site, there's a lot of leaders listening who have multiple locations, whether that's, you know, restaurant, church leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And you did say that, you know, this is, this is more descriptive, but there's a little bit of prescriptive there. There's a little bit like, yeah, maybe you should take a look at this. What would you say to leaders who are in multiple locations or thinking about it? What is, what is, what is a helpful uh, filter or decision-making framework that you would suggest they should look at? Do you really have a physical barrier? Really have a physical barrier to outreach, and this is the only solution. Mm. Second, um, when you're at your best and you're praying most diligently and you're most humble before God, is this a vanity project? Oh, wow. Um, so that I can say I'm multi-site, so I can say I'm a church of multiple locations, because that's the it factor. Um, third, if the reason you wouldn't shut it down is because of optics and pride and how it would look and how people might talk outside of the church and church world, but if you, but if you were just if, but if you knew you could shut it down, and there that wouldn't look be looked down on you know it would be best and you do it in a heartbeat? These are the kinds of questions. I, I am not, I, I, I hear some people uh, whenever anybody says anything about multi-site, and, and you're right, when we made our decision, a couple of other churches did around the same time, and it kind of collectively made some news. And um, there were some people that I almost felt like they had to go protect multi-site turf. Like, yeah. you know, we've got to protect the turf. It's like, who cares? I'm not <laughs> going after you. I don't care whether you're multi-site or not. I'm not trying to tear it down. If it works for you, yay, God. If if, if door-to-door visitation in Sunday school works for you, if bus ministry works for you, I'm going to be your biggest fan. I'm just saying that nothing's sacred. And for us, it made sense because of these realities that I think are facing all churches. I really do. I don't yeah. think the main barrier anymore is physical. I think it's digital. I, I think that when you look at the amount of money and time and bricks and mortar that it takes, um, you know, most churches, their sites are running three, four hundred each, and they're not like tearing it all down. And it's, 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 it's is there something better? Now, granted, you may not be sitting on 80 acres. You may not be able to expand. I, I get all that. I'm not trying to make mech. You know, I have no interest or need for everybody to do what we did. But I think every pastor who knows what's going on in our world needs to evaluate this very, very carefully, simply because of stewardship. I think the vanity uh, question is a great one to ask generally in leadership. And for anybody thinking of launching, it's infinitely more complicated to lead multiple sites than it is a single site. And it's a great question. You want to do this in, we all want to be one of the cool kids at some level, but is that really the motivation? Oh, man, those are, those are great questions. So let me ask you a hypothetical. Would you ever launch another location if it meant reaching more people? And if so, under what circumstances? I'd do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. I'd do it in a heartbeat. I, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't feel uh, awkward about it. Like, uh, oh, you're, you close them down, but now you're starting one. I would, I, I am so dispassionate <laughs> about that. All I care about is what is most effective. And I could easily envision uh, a physical site mattering in the future. Um, another thing too, you know, Carrie, I don't want to, I don't want to digress here, but you know that um, there's another a- aspect of this that I hope pastors are thinking about, and that is um, they're thinking about it theologically in terms of ecclesiology. I, I think I think that uh, the, the multi-site movement, no matter how you feel about it. It does need to be thought through theologically, particularly when you start leaving your city and leaving your area and start like, we're just going to do this all over the place. And wh- where does where does ecclesiology fit into that? And the reason that I want to say that is because I think that within certainly evangelical Christianity, ecclesiology is the most neglected doctrine and the one that is treated in the most cavalier way. And um, I do think that there is a much more robust ecclesiology in the New Testament than the average person gives it credit for. And I hear some horrific things about ecclesiology. You know, 
My, Can you define ecclesiology as ecclesiology, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's the doctrine of the church. And so you have, when I say a warped ecclesiology, is that modern American evangelicalism was actually birthed largely through the parachurch movement, which was uh, had a terrible ecclesiology itself. So when you have, you know, a college chapter of students saying, we're the church. No, you're not. You're not the church. Uh, the church is a very defined entity with entry and exit points, with defined leadership and sacraments and and, and uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a whole checklist of things that determines what a church is. And so when you start hearing things like, well, we're going to home church or, or we're going to do this or we're going we're gonna to be a church or we're going to have sites all over the place. Think it through really carefully in terms of what Scripture says and the doctrine of the church. And, um, and we can have honest disagreements about that, but at least think about it. Do you have a document? You, you write prolifically. This is why I'm asking. Do you have a blog post or a document or anything like that that would point to some of the essentials of ecclesiology that we could link to in the show notes? I write about it extensively. I've had it yeah. come up in the blog. And, um, and also, I, um, we just had an ebook uh, release on the Church and Culture site called Christ Among the Dragons. Um, it just got available as an ebook. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah it's an older book of mine, but it's, it just came out as an ebook. And I have a whole chapter in there uh, where I I rant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but 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 also, but where I make it very clear. And, and what tipped it off for me was back when I was president of Gordon Conwell, I was meeting in an office of an executive of a Fortune 500 company, Christian guy, uh, hat in hand, trying to raise money, you know, mm-hmm. for theological education. And I remember he kind of, and I talk about this in that book, tell the story where he goes, uh, was saying all the things that they were doing as this bottling company and how certain employees went on mission trips and they had hired a chaplain and for the company and all these wonderful things. And he says, and, and he's, and then he said, you know, he wasn't involved in a church himself because it was almost like he was superior to the church and more spiritual than the church. And, and then he made this statement, but after all, we're the church too. (laughs) I just wanted to explode. No, you are not. You know, a bottling company listed on, on the exchange is not the same as the bride of Christ, uh, you know, bristling with energy, pulling together the believers and spiritual gifts. And, and I mean, no, you're not. Oh, my God, you're not <laughs> the church. Um, and uh, so I do think we need to get back to a doctrine of what, what is the church. When, when, do we have, when do you have the church and when don't you have the church? Yeah. Uh, when do you have parachurch versus the other? And and just get clean on that. All right. So we'll we'll link to that uh, in the show notes for sure. Uh, that'll be worth looking up. And then that's good. That doesn't come up very often. So what would be the conditions, like hypothetically, where you would say, okay, here's our new location? Can you think of a couple of preconditions that would have to be met? Well, that the barrier really was physical. Okay. That we we yeah. couldn't surround it any other way. Uh, so and, if you had theoretically. And it was in our mission that God had called us mm-hmm. it was in our field. Um, I'm in Charlotte. Um, I, 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 and so if there was legitimate stuff, in, and even Charlotte's very divided in terms of kind of yeah. North and South. Yeah. But, um, but if, if I felt the barrier truly was physical and there was something that, that we could do unique that we couldn't do any other way to serve that physically, but even that Carrie, mm-hmm. I think the future of, Overcoming the physical barrier is not a bricks and mortar building as much as a pop up event. Oh yeah, yeah, we did talk about that last time. We talked about that. So, I think can you talk event. about pop up events? What? Yeah, what, I mean, what, this was what is sleeping craft breweries and all kinds yeah. of places where you take the physical to somebody as a way of, of presenting things in a physical way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've yeah. done pop up Christmas yeah. Eves exactly. for years. Exactly. I think that's going to be more the future of breaking through physical barriers and even okay. leading them from that to a digital exploration and into a physical location. Well, let's go to where this whole thing has been pointing toward the investment you want to make in digital, because that also raises ecclesiological issues as well, which is simply, yeah, like, is that actually church? Like what is, and I love asking guests, we don't get to it all the time, but a couple of times a year I'll have a guest on. I'm like, so is the digital stuff real? Is it church? Like, Give us your take on digital and why you want to do more and more investing there and what you're doing. Because I think that's how you're going to reach people. It is how you're going to reach Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's how people explore a church. It's how people now are having their opinions formed. Uh, Everything is online. You look at Generation Z, 
they don't even buy something on the store or buy anything anyway, unless it's online through referrals and other things. Everything is is uh, is digital these days. Exploration and education and delivery systems and community and um, education, everything is online. And that's how people do it. It is through their phone. It is through mm-hmm. their, uh, through the web, internet. So um, this, the front issue is, it's an obviously that's where uh, outreach is going to take place. Now, how much of that can actually be church? Well, I think that he, here's, where, here's where I would encourage people to think. And it's where I'm encouraging myself to think. If people say, can you have authentic community online? The answer is, it doesn't matter. It is online. It, it <laughs> is where community is. So it's where you have to start. It's where you have to work. So um, what I have to do is reach out and uh, enable online community and work with the online community that is there and then stair step people into the benefits of also physical community, because there are aspects of the one another's in scripture that really can't be done online, or at least maybe not optimally. But there's an awful lot now that can happen with online community that we weren't able to do even two years ago. There are apps that are affording much more intimacy and multiple visuals on the screen and interaction and that you couldn't have before. And so I think you can have community online. I think there are some aspects of it. We want to stair step them into more physical community but it's the reality of our day. Same thing with discipleship. Can you disciple someone online? It doesn't matter. That's where you're going to have to disciple them online. Yeah. And it's where you're going to have to at least start and, and begin. Yes. Is spending time with another person or a married couple critical? Yes. We all know about mentoring and the importance of that. But in the day of online education and Ted talks and everything else, that's where you're going to podcast. This is where you're going to get educated and you've just got to use that. So, it's just the church getting savvy about these things. And then also realizing that people are using their phone and the apps on the phone as their way of completely navigating the world. This is how they're navigating it. So why fight that? Why not go ahead and have and facilitate the use of their phone to navigate the experience of say, attending a a church. So on their way in, they can sign in their kids to children's ministry. They can order a coffee and be waiting for them at the cafe. They can um, go ahead and download message notes or see what the scripture is going to be. They come in and they're using their phone for all kinds of things, maybe getting parking updates and various other stuff. And then when they go in, they're using their phone to take notes and then uh, they can register right there for a class as well. Or then maybe when they're leaving, they get a specialized push notification about next steps that they can take and and additional resources and just, I mean, you can just make it so incredibly interactive for them and maximize the experience. See, I'd rather see that than have a big sign that says, okay, everybody put your phones away and turn them off (laughs) because you're shutting them down in a lot of ways that you could be turning them on. Are, are these things you're all doing? The things that you just listed? This is where we're putting all of our, this is where the money's going. Okay. So this is what's next. Yeah, and 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 we we found, like for example, we have what would be considered by almost all standards a state of the art database. Hmm. Uh, paid a fair amount of money for it. I, I if I told you the brand, there'd be a whole bunch of churches that say, "Yep, that's the one we use." We found that it is absolutely archaic in a digital world. It it like our app. It doesn't even work with an app on a phone, and yet. The main way that people interact with a website is through their phone. So it's a mobile device. That's the main thing to interact with an app. And the average app is not designed to work with a mobile device. And so what we're after is, and we're having now, we got a team of, I think it's like 30 people, uh, software, brilliant people. It's going to take them a year to develop an original database system for us that can house our website app, ticketings, we have to ticket all of our major events, um, and all the different social media and all of our social media feeds, but also all of our digital marketing, because we do almost entirely digital marketing, so that it's all one thing, and it all talks to each other. Now, that makes sense, but you'd be surprised how that just doesn't exist. Yeah, no, I I hear what you're saying. And and I mean, that's deeper pockets, too. Most of the leaders listening would not have the resource for that. Yes and no. 
Okay, tell me more. For us to outsource it would be seven figures. Yeah. We're paying uh-huh. nothing. All right, well, tell me more. <laughs> Even volunteers. Wow, seriously? They're given a year of their life. And, Damn. And, and I mean, these are people that are highly motivated. And, he, and here's what I love. When I Whoa. began to say, who out there has this kind of expertise? Um, you know, these people stepped up and said, you know what? Uh, the guy who's spearheading it for us, uh, a volunteer, um, he said, everybody I've talked to is so excited because they finally get to use their area of expertise for the cause of Christ. And they never knew if they could, oh, like, man. how do I, how do I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I write code. How can that serve Jesus? Oh my gosh. Write code for Jesus. You yeah, know, yeah. So and so we actually found an enormous amount of enthusiasm. So what we, what we have to invest in is staff to work with volunteers so that they're right. served and they're cared for. But if you were to outsource this to a company and say, Oh okay, no, I know. I mean, immediately oh, I'm like, how much is that costing you? Five, 10 million? Like, come on. Yeah, yeah. It's seven figures. Wow. Okay. And so is this something with 30 volunteers that they can do evenings, weekends, breaks, that kind of thing? Or? That's the beauty of this because yeah. it's all done in their homes and they just coordinate. It's all, they're all talking to each other online and through various social media outlets and they can divide and conquer various parts of it. And, um, yeah, I mean, they give me updates that I understand about 20% of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but they, 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 they use, they use little words for me. And so, but they're just, is this something you would ever make available to other churches once it's that's mature? Yeah, yeah. That's our, that's yeah. Our a little goal. bit like what life church has done with a lot of their stuff. It's just like, here you go, church. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So, you gave us a little bit of the vision for what this thing can do. You can, you know, check in your kids, order your mobile coffee, uh, upload the scripture, take notes, get prompted for your next step on the way out. Anything else you're envisioning where this could go? Well, I mean, also you want to dovetail with all of your social media and your digital marketing outreach, which we are doing extensively. And so um, you you want to be able to say, Hey, this person came through this particular Google pop up or this Facebook ad or this particular they responded uh, with um, this particular streaming service that we did uh, something with, uh, like on Pandora or something. And so you, you want to be able to flow that in and out and then begin to compile okay, which air things worked best for the hardcore unchurched, which worked best for various demographics, so that you have that data. And you're able to then form very sophisticated outreach um, attempts through digital marketing, because the beauty of digital marketing is you can be so highly segmented, but you pay for that segmentation. But if you can begin to capture that information yourself, you then don't have to pay a marketing firm for it. Right, right. It's it's just it's just a, a, a new a new day where so much of what you're doing is going to be digital in nature. Small groups might meet online and actually have their Bible study through some type of, you know, house chat party app. Um, and uh, we're developing a lot of online tools so that that one we're working on right now is very cool with our, our evangelism team is where you go online and you just take a quick survey of questions. And then from that, we're able to customize uh, how you might want to best explore Christianity based on the nature of your questions. And so we're customizing outreach so that it's totally done by them and they don't feel like somebody's evangelizing them. They feel like they're just, they're on a customized exploration. And that's keyword. So much of what technology allows you to do is to customize for that individual. And that's exactly what people who are particularly Gen Z are expecting everything to be customized because they grew up in a digital world where everything was customized. And so we are trying to customize discipleship, which is, I think, good, customize evangelism, uh, customize how best to get you networked and get you assimilated. We're able to customize that based on your need, because the way you might assimilate a single parent mom versus a young couple with two kids are very different. The way you would evangelize someone who's a neo-atheist versus someone who's just been burned by judgmentalism is very different. Um, and so you want to be able to customize even your evangelistic approaches. Yeah, that's interesting. And that also assumes a lot of forethought about, well, what does the stream for a new atheist look like and for a lapsed Christian and for somebody who quit going to church when they were 18, but still kind of believes or from somebody who comes from, 
you know, a more eclectic, personal, spiritual path. Somebody's got to be masterminding that. So do you have a whole team on that or how, how is that? How's that working? That's one of the areas where I'm investing most of my time. So, oh. um, I, one of my, one of my jobs is to stay as abreast of culture as I possibly can. One of my top spiritual gifts is evangelism. And, um, and so I'm certainly not doing it alone, but this is where I'm investing an enormous amount of my time and my effort and, and what little expertise I might have, uh, throwing it into it. But I, I have, um, I've, you know, is I've studied the rise of the nuns and written on it. I've studied Generation Z and written on it. I just came out with a book designed specifically for non-Christians, the fruit of many years of listening and working. And we're just kind of trying to put all that into play in a customizable way for people. So I've got another question on the digital about, um, I just live in Charlotte. I'm like, I've got spiritual questions. I stumble on uh, your church website. One of the problems a lot of us have who play in the digital space, which is just about all of us, is, yeah, Facebook can track and you can put a cookie there. You can put this there. But at the end of the day, I don't know it's Jim White and I don't know who you are. Do you have a process, a strategy or plan on how to get people to identify themselves sooner? Or is that something you want? Like even, you know, this episode will get listened to by 25,000, 30,000 people in the first 30 days. I don't know who those people are unless you, unless you shout out on social going, man, love James Emery White. He was great. I, I have no idea who you are. I can tell you what country you're from. I can tell you what city they live in. I can tell you it's going to be New York, LA, Dallas, Chicago is the top cities, Atlanta, Charlotte, like, you know, I know those things, Nashville, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know who it is. So how do you, how do you get people to identify? We work hard for them to not have to. We work really Okay. So you, them. you want to keep it anonymous. We want them to feel like they can keep it as anonymous as they want. And so if we put on the threshold of some of these things, like an evangelism tool, we wouldn't call it an evangelism tool, but right. like, we would never say, okay, the way you begin is give us your name, your email, <laughs> phone number. No email capture on day one. <laughs> just wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Yeah. We, would, we would make it as, and, and we would just say, and, and this, is, this, is, this is one thing that has never changed in working with the unchurched in all the years that I've been doing it. They still don't want to surface until they want to surface. They still want to sit in the back near the exit sign. They still don't want to sing. They might like the participatory atmosphere, but they're not going to be belting out reckless love the first day that they're there. Right. This is not so. So you you need to be able to let them do that, and then when they're ready to surface, they surface. And so, yeah, a lot. I mean, many many times, the first time we know that somebody has been uh, poking around for months is when they come out of the waters of baptism. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's just they they're ready to they're ready to surface, or they show up at one of our Mech Institute classes and, or they, they, you know, we, we, um, but we really want the online experience to be wide, wide, wide open. And then they can let us know when they're ready. Cause otherwise we could scare them off. When do people tend to surface? Do they tend to surface online or do they tend to surface in person where it's like, cause I've, I've met, you know, in our foyer on a Sunday morning, I'll run into people who will say, I've been attending for a year online, but this is my first Sunday. That and that's that. more and more common. We hear that all the time. Yeah. Uh, now the way we work our online campus is different than some. We, we really treat it like a campus. We call it a right. campus. We have a campus pastor. We have, um, we have set times that you have to log in. A lot of people say, why do you do that? We want it to be where... The chat room is, is, is vigorous. It's monitored by a pastor. We can take prayer requests. You can be prayed with right then. You can interact with other people and ask questions. It's, it's a live event, and you have to log in for it. So it's like you're attending that particular uh, campus event. We feel like another reason that we do that, and a lot of churches are going to get in trouble, I'm afraid, that don't know this. If you just put your service out there to be watched anytime, just throw it out on YouTube or something, and you can just watch anytime you want. You've got a whole nother world of copyright issues. All of a sudden now, you've got to be paying us a lot more for the music that's on there, and you've got to be doing, there are certain things that you, you uh, it's, it's a different copyright world. Now, I think that, um, and somebody's going to get sued 
and, and it's going to wake everybody up. Right. But if we did that, we'd have to eliminate all the worship and all the other experiences and all the other stuff. And it would just be my talk. Um, so we but when you do it like a service event, you log on to not only do we feel like it's more of an actual service um, that we're able to serve those people, um, but we're able to have the entire experience. But that that always that almost forces somebody to put their hand up and go, yeah, it's Carrie. I mean, they can use fake names on the whole deal, but yeah, they don't have to enter the chat room, though, either. Oh, they don't. Oh, OK, so they can just watch it anonymously without yeah. having to enter. OK, yeah. and then they, gotcha. can, they can surface if they want to in the chat room or they can just not you can have a place where you can anonymously leave a prayer request. But um, OK, so you're still giving them choice. Mm hmm. Yeah. And you've got the podcast, I'm sure, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of access points. Anything else on digital? And then I got a couple more questions for you. No. I'm great. Sometimes I'll let you know. Something comes to mind. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, such an exploding field that, that there's almost no limit to talking about all the different ways and different ideas and different things that we're exploring. So it'd be easy to think that we're talking to a 29-year-old leader here, but you've been at this for three decades. And uh, you and I were talking ahead of time. You know, one of the challenges when you reach our stage of life is that a lot of leaders, they're still in position, uh, but the lights went out a long time ago. Or they're just, they just stopped growing and learning in the methodology from the early 2000s or five years ago or 10 years ago. Is just, that's the hill they're going to die on. You're not like that. How do you stay fresh? How do you stay engaged? And how do you manage? What are some of the rhythms or disciplines you've used to say that almost three decades in, this thing is still growing double digits and there is a bright future and you're moving into that future with a full tank. Two things come to mind. Uh, a couple things come to mind. One is I had an experience that some of your listeners who are familiar with me may mm -hmm. remember. And that is that I had a brief sojourn where I was president of seminary. Yeah. And uh, I prayed faithfully with that. Uh, I also prayed faithfully and felt very obedient to God when that ended. But that cemented for me, I love being a pastor. Mm -hmm. I love leading men. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. It's like, it like some people, if they have a midlife crisis, they go out and buy a red sports car. I was president yeah. of the seminary. <laughs> and, 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 and I always kind of felt like if I had never did this, that would be like the dream. And I never felt like, you know, it would ever be a possibility, but it's like, Oh, if I could ever do anything, I'd be go teach at a seminary. A lot of pastors feel that way. Uh, they love their seminary years and all that. Well, I got the opportunity to be the president of one of the five largest seminaries in North America. Yeah. Uh, the one that's called the Harvard of the seminaries. Right. And, uh, okay. I want to go back to Mech so bad. <laughs> and I won't go into all the details of all the reasons and ins and outs of that. I mean, it was obviously more uh, uh, complex than that. But um, uh, it, 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 was, it renewed me. It cleansed me. It got whatever wanderlust I had out of me. It rekindled my appreciation for what um, we get to do. And so that was huge. In terms of staying, but there was another, the other dynamic is, is that I remember I was uh, asked by a former student of mine uh, to come and speak at his church, mega church, you know the name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, and this was many, about a long time ago, I remember though looking out at the crowd and thinking how young it was. Yeah. And I and I went back the next, and it was just this young, all 20 and 30 somethings. I went back to Mech the next weekend, and it was like God had set me up. Every person on stage was 40 or older. Yeah. Just a fluke, mm -hmm. you know, but it was. Every person on stage was. And I just, I just said, this is not going to happen. We're not going to be a one-and-done generational church. I said, we're going to skew young. I don't know if anybody that's done it. I don't know how to do it, but we're going to skew young. And so I began to do several things that worked. And so for the last at least 10 years, we have actually as a church gotten younger every year. Every year we've gotten younger. Now we um, 
we are a church that's almost entirely of people in their 20s and 30s. Mecca is almost entirely. Really? And um, I would say two-thirds to maybe three-fourths of our staff are in their 20s. How did you do that? What well, did you do? Started, what were some of the shifts? Off, you, you always attract to your platform. Yeah. So very purposefully began to platform younger. You always also, I began to staff young. Mm-hmm. And it, the tendency is the older you get, the more you look for people more your age or so. I began to almost entirely, I, I think I went through one phase where I don't, I don't think I can remember the last time I hired somebody older than 30. I can't even remember. I can't remember. And it's not like I'm opposed. It's just that I'm trying to find a young person because that brings reverse mentoring. Right. So, and, and the way this is working, a lot of people say, well, how can somebody who is, I'm 58, I've got 11 grandchildren. <laughs> how, 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 well, how am I connecting with twenties and thirties? It's so interesting. A lot of people feel like well, the answer is you got to dress in skinny jeans. You got to talk slang. And, and I see guys my age doing that in churches. And it just, it, to me, it's repulsive. It's just so weird. And it's repulsive to a 20 something too. And yeah. much more than they probably realize. Just be who you are and be natural. What they're hungry for is they're hungry for mentoring. They've got endless access to information and almost no access to wisdom. And they've never been parented and they've never had a functional family. And so if you can be that father figure and a wisdom figure who is culturally literate and who is relevant, but who's bringing wisdom to bear and you're almost fathering them in a way they never were fathered, the attraction is just palpable. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like, like there's something, there's this, this, this wonderful dynamic where here's this stage full of teens and 20 somethings, but then out walks this older mature person to tackle older mature stuff. Because, you know, it's, it's like, I saw a tweet the other day. I wish yeah. I'd say it. it was some, uh, 20 something guy who said, I wish all 20 and 30 something pastors would quit talking about how to have the perfect marriage and raise perfect kids until they've done it. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and certainly don't write a book about it. Yeah. You no, know, let me tell you how to parent and you've got a, a 10 year old. Oh, please, <laughs> please. <laughs> At least get to 20. See so if you live. Yeah. There's, there's something about when, for example, Susan and I get up there and talk about marriage and a lot of times we'll, we'll team teach that. And we're up there and we've been married 35 years. We can talk in a way that other people can't. I've got four children who all came to know Christ and who are all four have been in vocational ministry, all four. Wow. Um, and so, and, and, and they're all, they're all in their twenties and thirties with children of their own. I can, I can talk about parenting in light of all the seasons. Hmm. And I can, and uh, as well as I can talk to young parents about what they're going through, because I have 11 grandchildren. (laughs) Yeah, that's a lot of grandkids. I mean, you want to talk to me about twos? Let me talk to you about twos. (laughs) How many twos you got? (laughs) I had six in my house last night. (laughs) You got nothing. (laughs) So it's, it's, it's a sweet time. And, uh, I, I love working with, young people. I love working with the young staff. I love what, uh, by God's grace, I'm able to bring to a younger demographic at this stage of my life while at the same time, not missing the older demographic. And, um, so yeah, we're younger than we ever have been before. We're, we're growing as fast or faster as we ever have before. I, I love the challenge of the rise of the nuns. I love the evangelistic challenge. I love how now you can teach where you can reach unchurched people and disciple um, the already convinced and with the same bullet. You couldn't do that 10, 15 years ago. No, it was, it was separate. Yeah. And I love that. I love the technology challenge. I love, I love grooming. Um, and I, and I'm, and I'm going to love passing the baton. Hmm. I'm going to love to do that. I, and I just want to, I know I'm on my last best run. And I realize it's that, and I appreciate it, and I'm thankful for it. And so, um, oh, I, I'm 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 very excited. I love the writing I'm getting to do these days. Mm-hmm. I just love it. It's just so much fun. Well, and you're you're prolific. 
uh, in your writing too. I want to ask you about your your rhythms for that. But that's interesting. You mentioned passing the baton, and uh, I'm not going to ask you for a timeline or anything like that. Uh, but what are what's that? When I'm seventy. When you're seventy. I'd like, I'd like to go to seventy. I okay. think seventy is just sixty-five. I was going to ask you how how would you pick that figure? How would you how would you know? What are the signs when you know? Yeah. All right, this the- is my time. Yeah, I, I just I think some of it you just need to predetermine because I don't know I don't know if I want to go by emotion. I'd like mm. to go by a sense of meeting. And as I look at it now, um, seventy seems like a good figure to pass it on to somebody else. Maybe I could hang around doing some role, but I'd want to do it in a way that served. Uh, the church will have uh, celebrated its fortieth anniversary. There's just a lot about it that I think would be sweet. Um, I don't. I'm not one of these that want to die in the pulpit. I'm not one of these that want to cling to it while my teeth are falling out. I, yeah. I want to, I want to finish well, pass it on and be a cheerleader for that next leader. And, and Susan does too. And just come find me. I'll be sitting in the nursery holding babies mm. and having a blast, having an absolute blast. I, 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 I don't, I would only go past that if I, if it was just collectively seen as really strategic and it was just so clear. And I, I don't, I just think that that's my, that's my thinking now and have that leader on board two or three years before then. And to where, you know, like maybe, okay, it starts off where he's doing 20% of the teaching and I'm doing 80 and the next year, 60, 40, and then flip it yeah. 40, 60. So that by the time I'm done, it's like, who's he? Right, right, right. Which is kind of what we've done over the last five years. You've done a good church. Job, well, we're learning. We're, we're, we're going to see, uh, you you read a lot, you write a lot and you write well. And what, what amazes me about your writing is it's actually deep. It's thought through, obviously your scholarly background comes through, but you're also a real student of pop culture research, etc. Can you walk us through, cause obviously you're leading this huge digital project. You are still in point leadership in your church. Plus you're popping out books every, I don't know, months, year or so. You got a new book coming out and they're real. They're not like, oh, here's this little sermon series I wrote, a fluffy little piece that turned into a book. They're like real books. Um, talk talk about how those disciplines are part of your life these days. I love to read. I think that helps. Mm. I was raised by, my mom was a school teacher. Uh, my father was a PhD scientist research. Um, and but my mom could talk about a book like it was something good to eat. <sighs> and we were disciplined. I was disciplined by whether or not we could go to the library. And so I, I, I had that, that love of reading given to me as a child, which was a priceless gift. Um, I feel like one of my jobs as a pastor and as a professor and as a writer and the blogging that I do is I, I am to be a student of culture. My, my fascination is the interplay of theology and culture. I'm still a professor of theology and culture at Gordon-Conwell. And so that interplay fascinates me. So I, I take that seriously as a discipline. And so uh, I have time set aside every day where I am surveying uh, uh, cultural epicenters, uh, news and cultural outlets that actually results on the churchandculture.org blog, uh, churchandculture.org site, where every day the four most, um, uh, we think, important, I think, important news stories related to church and culture, faith and culture are posted. And so I own that personally. And so one of my disciplines is what it takes to stay so abreast that you're able to present the four most uh, important stories of that day. And you do that every day is a wonderful discipline for me. And so um, I do that. I'm a um, subscriber. I appreciate what you produce. Uh, when, when do you do that reading? When, how, like, take us a little I, bit down I, through that. I get up to 430 or so the latest every day. Yeah. And I have, uh, before I even do my workout, which is until 6.30, I've got two hours that I am doing an enormous amount of things, my quiet time, but also uh, surveying various things and doing my news surveys and various things of that nature. I have writing days set aside and writing blocks uh, all day Tuesday and then Wednesday morning and Thursday morning are my writing blocks, and they're completely protected and preserved at my home study. Um Another thing, too, that's helpful, and, and I, I don't think you and I have talked about this. Mm. Everybody says to, when you're thinking about staff and stuff, hire your weaknesses. I think that there's a place to hire someone who has your same strengths. 
So, for example, if I'm a writer and I need help to uh, increase the capacity of my writing, I want to hire or surround myself with a really good writer, someone who's an excellent editor and really a writer and can actually help you expand your ability to do things. And I've been very blessed to be able to have one person in particular who is um, allows me to increase my output at least two or threefold because of their writing skills, their editing skills, their their research skills. Um, and um, and so I think that you need a mixture of both. But I mean, I, I think that you can like like you may feel like let's just say with you you let's say you and i don't know this is true you might say well i need help with this administrative things i'm not any good with administration okay good get that yeah that's me but what if you also were to get an excellent podcaster yes not so much to take your role but to help you shape content and pick guests and and write questions and and so that you are able to like gosh i used to do one podcast a week i can do three if i've got this being done for me yeah so I think there's a place for that as, as how well. do you use your writer? How do how do you use that writer? Well, this one particular person is um, what they do is that is that when I get finished with a writing project, whether it's a blog or a book, they take it and they do full editing for me, oh. and you know just just go over it and just completely catch every grammatical error, uh, make sure footnotes and notes are accurate, flush those out if all I've got's a link. Um, they, they are, um, you know, uh, polish up various things. In fact, every blog that I send out goes through two people after me and both of them give it a careful reading, make all the adjustments that need to be made. And so I can write it, but I'm not having to spend the time to painstakingly go over it for, uh, grammatical errors, misspellings. Did this link actually work? I can, so I've got a team of people that do that and help me with that. I do all the writing. I don't have ghost writers, but yeah, me too. people that, that just, uh, I don't have to do all the work that's involved in producing a book or a blog. Right. I right. just do it right. Do you lose, utilize that team for messages as well? No. Okay. That's just your I writing. Use, I don't use any services for messages. I don't use anything for messages. I don't, I, that is raw. Um, now I will say, here's what, here's what I do have a team that does though, or a person that does is that when I get, when I, I write a, a, my talk and then I go through it orally before I give it and I'm making all kinds of like things that I want to say differently as I go through it orally. So it's my manuscripts very marked up things mm -hmm. crossed out, changed. And, and so when I get done having delivered it, I turn that file over to someone who then takes all those changes logs them back in and creates a fresh, clean document that is then put on the church and culture site uh, to serve others. And so oh, it, wow. it, is, it is all completely done and also reflects the changes and the inflections that were made as it was presented live. So this is interesting. You said you spend, did I get this right? All day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, and most of Thursday. Okay. So all day Monday, I'm in the office. Uh, all day Tuesday, I'm writing Wednesday morning, writing Wednesday afternoon office, Thursday morning, writing Thursday afternoon office, Friday's off. Wow. That's my schedule. And you lead a very large church with that kind of schedule. How do you stay out of the weeds? You know, I, I, there's a couple of things that, I mean, I've got a lot of leadership weaknesses, hmm. but one of them is not, uh, the failure to delegate. I find delegate. I, lo I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a micromanager. I am not a micromanager. And so I, uh, so staff that thrive, not being micromanaged, um, uh, do a really, do really well here. If somebody were to show up at my door every morning and say, Hey, give me the five things I'm supposed to do today. I mean, shoot me now. <laughs> I, I, you know, I want to hire, you want to bring on people who intuitively know what to do and they only come to you when they need coaching or help pass something or to think through something. But, um, and also we're very, very stripped down. We're, we're not this heavy kind of hierarchy of order. It's a, it's a flat structure. It's just mm -hmm. really flat. And so even when key decisions are made, we don't have 
uh, a standing leadership. We don't even have a standing leadership team. Really? No. Wow. The way it works is, is that every major decision or any decision needs to be made. And here's kind of our mantra. Let's get the right people around the table to make this decision. Who are the right people? And it changes. Now, there might be the, the usual suspects, but it's like whatever the decision is, let's get the right people around the table. Uh, and then let's have that discussion and then let's hash it out. And this is the decision making body. This is it. Mm. And cool. so it works really well for us. So very stripped down um, structure. Vast majority of our people don't even have job titles. They have areas of responsibility, but not titles. And it's just very, very organic, kind of more Appleish than Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> How many direct reports do you have? Or do you think about it that way? Um, to a degree, I have to, but I would, I mean, not many, not many. I don't, I, I really don't. You're not I, in a lot of meetings every week. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I, I, my, the meetings that I'm involved in are, are strategic decision-making kind of gatherings. Um, there's a lot of meetings that go on, but I'm not invited. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I could show if I wanted to and, if they knew I wanted to be there, they'd love to have me there. But I, 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 I trust these people. They're sharp. They've got the mission down. They know the vision and values. Whenever it comes back to me after their work, I mean, it's kind of like for potential veto. So I'm kept abreast of everything. Most of my leadership is by is I'm keeping abreast of everything, and I'm I'm getting involved where and when needed. Um, How do you stay so, abreast? Uh, crunch a lot of emails, manage by walking around. Um, I, I stick my head in a lot of offices every day. I just, you know, just how you doing? Anything I need to know, you know, you can, you can, I can take a walk through the buildings and be back in an hour and done like a week's worth of leadership and dealt with a lot of issues. Because I don't tend to be wordy. People learn not to be wordy around me. If I get a long email, I just send it right back. And I said, look, I don't have time to read this. Either stick your head in the door or shrink it. Because I don't have time to read this. And, and so, you know, and, and so they all know that when my door is open, anybody can stick their head in. And I'm just immediately, we can deal with whatever they want. I might see 20 people in an hour that way. So, and that's another good thing about separating my writing time at home from here is that when I'm here, I'm here. I am totally. You're poor. not trying to hide out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been rich, man. I went in so many different places than I thought it might. It's been good. Anything else you want to share with leaders, Jim, before we, uh, we wrap this one up, it will uh, be part two and many more, I'm sure. Well, you know, I, if, if you'll allow me, because I care yeah. about it so much, I'd love a shameless plug for the new book and yeah, I'll, tell you please. Why. I'll tell you why um, I have written a lot of books and this is one that uh, years ago I wrote a little book called the search for the spiritual that was totally designed for the non-Christian to read God bless that book um, enormously and I'm so grateful for it uh, but it, it it's dated it got mm -hmm. very dated and the questions have changed and the, and the issues have changed and so one of the things that I wanted to do and was uh, to once again write a book that's explicitly written to and for a non-Christian so that a Christian could give it to a non-Christian and it would be written sensitively and winsomely and compellingly just for them and that churches could use it to give to non-Christians and it could just be this huge evangelistic tool. Um, Lee Strobel uh, has lent his support to it. Yeah. I, got, I wanted to bring C.S. Lewis into it as a traveling companion because it's audacious to say you're going to update mere Christianity, but that was kind of the go-to book. Hmm. How could you not, how could you kind of have that as part of the goal, but obviously realizing you can't tie his shoes. Right. So the CS Lewis foundation gave me permission to use Lewis more than any other book. Hmm. So I'm able to bring him along as a traveling companion. So it's almost like you're getting mere Christianity, but totally updated dealing with all the issues of the day, astrophysics, LGBTQ issues, judgmentalism, intolerance, hypocrisy, uh, neo atheism, the character of God, all the issues that are fresh for this day. And so I am, I am praying Carrie, 
that this is a book that will be used by Christians for their non-Christian friends and family and coworkers and neighbors. And it is as selfless a plug as I could imagine making for any book because it's, it's just purely to, to reach people for Jesus. And so I need that kind of book as a pastor. There's, there's a most, almost all the books out there are either apologetics for Christians or telling Christians how to talk to non-Christians. But this is a book for this direct. goes direct. Yeah. And I, I even Baker was even so good with me uh, about like, OK, how are we going to design the cover? How are you going to do plugs? Because you, you can't you can't even put blurbs on there. You, you know, uh, right. Fact, Another Christian author, saying what a great author book. There is Lee yeah. Strobel and, and, it, and yeah. him as a former atheist uh, award winning reporter talking about how he wished this book had been around when he was an atheist. That was the only blurb that we even allowed. So everything wow. about it was designed for non-Christians. So, yeah. <laughs> you know I what think. I noticed about it? it? It is a great book, and I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned it. We just ended up in so many different fields, I never really got to it. But um, you have pictures in it, which mm-hmm. is fast. T- tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that we did was like a survey of what are people's top questions about Jesus, like a yeah. non-Christian. You know what the number, one of the number one was? Mm-mm. What did he look like? Seriously? <laughs> What do you look like? And so in that chapter, we actually show, you know, here's what Jesus may have looked like based on um, reproductions and various other things. And and it uh, and we had the special permission for that. I mean, there's all there's some of the coolest visuals and pictures in this book that are designed with the, the questions and interests of a non-Christian. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, pictures are used all throughout it. And you open it with uh, the story of C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity from atheism, right? And, yeah, uh, and I kind of introduced him and said, hey, listen, here's, here's going to be the third person on this journey that we're taking. And, uh, and I tell some during my, I tell him that, uh, I kind of describe Lewis in a way that most people don't. Kind of the side of Lewis that would make him not even accepted at the evangelical schools that house yeah. his books. Uh, he was an earthy guy. Yeah. And a uh, very earthy guy, but I loved it. I love it. And I even told some stories that uh, I had been told while I was studying at Oxford from people who knew Lewis. And um, that, well, you got to uh, give us one of those stories now. Can't just leave us hanging. Well, when I was, uh, I would do my writing in the Eagle and Child pub in the afternoons and was doing some studies in the morning and just got to know the people because I was a regular there and got, they kind of asked me different things. I would ask them questions. And they would say that, uh, they said, well, you know that the Inklings met in the morning a lot of times, and Lewis would start drinking then, and he would come to class with um, alcohol in his breath, and they said, sometimes a bit of a buzz. <laughs> Not drunk, <laughs> just, just you know, he'd been at the pub. And his coat would have um, burn holes in the pockets because he kept putting his pipe in while it was smoking it, put it in, the ashes would burn through, so his coat had these little burn pockets in them. He was just, and he was kind of a, a louder, outspoken guy, kind of outgoing and kind of earthy and um, kind of the opposite of Tolkien, who was more reserved and prim and proper and, <laughs> and Lewis, Lewis was more the you know robust Irish guy. So it was just fun to hear those little things. And I kind of introduced him a little bit and in a way that um, as I'm writing to, the, to, to this, you know, to people who aren't Christians, you know, I said, you know, uh, I don't know what your stereotype of a Christian is, but I think you would have liked this guy. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so funny how we get so buttoned down, right? In our, in our faith. And so worried about that stuff, but yeah, Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia uh, meet together <laughs> where you were as well. Well, Jim, people are going to want to connect with you online. So uh, tell us where they can find you and where they can find your church to watch this amazing transformation. Well, all the stuff, uh, related to blogs and books and resources and messages and downloads and all that. It's all at churchandculture.org. Right. And then the church's website is mecklenburg.org. That's M-E-C-K-L-E-N-B-U-R-G.org. And uh, again, but hold on to your seat with that one because we're in the midst of a radical revamping of our website that'll debut um, over the next few months. So you're seeing an awesome. earlier iteration. But yeah. And the book once more, it's available everywhere. Right. Yep. And it's called Christianity for People Who Aren't Christians. James Emery White. Thank you so much. It's been just a joy once again. Thanks for, thanks for having me.